Hey everybody, Ryan Schramm. Thanks so much for checking out the podcast. Super excited for you guys to see today's guest, Dylan Tortorolo, local San Clemente mortgage broker. And we got into some really good topics like the different types of loans, what you need for a down payment, what are interest rates doing, and the overall process. It was extremely valuable, so be sure and check it out. Dylan, what's happening? Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for being here with us. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, yeah it's exciting. It. Yeah, very exciting. It's cool to get up here with you. We we do a lot of business together. Yeah. Uh, tell us what you do. Well, I'm a mortgage broker here in town, okay. uh, in San Clemente. Um, I grew up in San Clemente. I've lived here my whole life. I don't think I'm going anywhere. <laughs> I want to stay here. Um, good. You I'm know, happy about that. We're homeowners in San Clemente too, which is great. Nice. You know, so... Um, yeah, I mean, I went to San Clemente high school, played baseball and hockey, nice. played some college ball. So, um, and I got, I, when I realized my baseball career was kind of up, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> I moved back in with my parents and then they were like, Hey, you need to get a job, man. You get know, out so of here. I'm like, yeah. Or get out. Yeah. So, so I basically went down to the local cafe and I was like, Hey, I need to find a job. Can I apply here? And, um, they kind of pushed me off cause I was a guy and there was all girls working there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I was persistent. I kept going back and finally Tara hired me and that was my first job. So nice. I was like, okay, I, I got my parents taken care of, you know, and, uh, now I have a job. So I was just kind of like, Hey, going through the day to day, you yeah. know, in San Clemente, living the, the good life, you know, golfing in the mornings, golfing afternoons, surfing beach on the weekends. So yep. yeah, I mean, it was a great childhood here. That's awesome. Man. Yeah. So when did you get into the mortgage business? So that's kind of why I led to pipes because I was working at pipes for three years uh -huh. and I had a lot of frequent customers. And one of them came up to me one day and said, Hey Dylan, like, what's your plan? Yeah. And I, I was kind of shocked. I was like, wow, plan. What do you mean? I'm, I'm 21. Yeah. You know, I don't have a plan. Right. And so he said, Hey, I run a mortgage team that works with builder accounts and I, I need somebody to help. And you might be the guy to yeah. interview. So I went in for the interview and he hired me and I was shocked, but I was real like excited, ready to go. And I was ready to start a new career path that I knew could lead to something in the future. Yeah. So, so. you're, you got your start then working for a team that worked on new construction build, right? Yeah. Out of Irvine, Irvine. Yes, I recall. Exactly. Sweet. Yeah. And then you transitioned into more of the, uh, resale side, which is like where right. I work. Exactly. Exactly. So when I was with the builder, I was a pre-qualification specialist. So I okay. saw paperwork after paperwork and approved buyers multiple a day. Sometimes okay. we had 200 applications in on one day. Really? So we were looking at a lot of documentation, understanding how to qualify and pre underwrite files. Okay. But I didn't have much experience in the resale market mm -hmm. or even conducting a loan from start to finish. Got it. Right. Cause I was involved in the front end, mm -hmm. which was a great learning experience. Right. But I wanted to learn more. Right. So it led me to, leaving that builder team yep, and starting my career essentially as my own loan officer. Nice. Yeah. So, so you've really seen the whole gamut then. I mean, being <laughs> in new construction, which is a, com for our listeners, like that's a completely different animal being different in new construction yep. versus being in, in resale, which is a house that's, you know, somebody's already bought it and lived in it and it right. continues to trade. Yep. So you've really kind of seen the whole course of of lending, right. So to speak. Yes. So bring it up to present day where you're at now. So I, um, I'm with Arbor financial group now. Okay. We're a local broker here in orange County and direct lender. Nice. So we have capabilities, um, to fund loans in house and to broker out to other banks. We have 75 different banks we work with. Really? So a lot of options. Do yeah. I use all 75? No. At the end of the day, yeah. no, I don't. But when I review applications and I see something a little bit different, I know I have a backup plan. I know yeah. I have somebody else to go to, to offer that person a product. Yeah. And that's important. I think a lot of people who are getting a home loan are wondering like, what's the difference between when you say you're a broker or when you say like, oh, I work with Chase Bank or something like that. Right. What's like the layman's simple way of explaining the difference? Um, so there's, there's three main uh sources of lending for mortgages that I look at. I look mm -hmm. at the, the big bank side, which is your Bank of America, Chase, US right. Bank, things like that. And then you have a retail bank, which is like your Loan Depot, New American Funding, yeah. uh, Quicken Loans, things like that. Okay. Um, and then there's the broker side, which right. is direct to the bank, okay. or we call that wholesale as well. So the big banks offer a very like small box of product. Okay. Right? It's only what they have and they'll only give you what's available. And Got if it. you don't fit within that specific box, 
you're going to have to go elsewhere. Yeah. Right. It's, there's no other option. That's good. That's a yeah. really good way of explaining it. Yeah. So you might, if you fit into the box, you might be able to go to a big bank. Right. Exactly. But most people, as we've seen, don't fit into it, that, that, box. that perfect little box. Yeah, yeah exactly. So gotcha. that's where, where we look at, you know, especially as a loan officer, yeah. I want to be able to offer my clients a lot of different products yeah. at good pricing as well. And so when you look at the big bank, you either have one or the other, you have the product or the price mm -hmm. you go to a retail bank. And that's more of like, when I said the loan depots, you have different levels of management. So you have a lot of, a lot of help as a loan officer. There's a lot of uh, background things going on that support you. Yeah. Those are also sometimes built into the price of the product that you're selling to the client. Mm -hmm. And so at times you can get a higher rate. Um, you'll also get really good products. They have more products available, but they're still heavily regulated as an FDIC. So they have those guideline overlays that the big banks kind of also have, but they have a little bit more lenience in regards, in regards to programs and guidelines. Got it. So, which led me, and what's funny is when I did the builder thing, yeah. I was at Bank of America. Okay. So I've been at Bank of America. Got it. I've worked it. Um, I was at New American Funding for a little bit. I experienced that. Mm -hmm. And I chose to go the broker route, which was, you know, a little scary at first because I hadn't experienced it. Right. And I don't know a lot of people that had. But when I jumped in, I have not looked back. Nice. I mean, I have been able to offer clients almost every product that has come that I have. Yeah. Um, rates are excellent. I have the flexibility to be my own boss and do what I need to do to help the client, spend right. the time with the client. So it's pretty cool. Essentially, I run my own business. Yeah. And yeah. I've seen that transformation cool. because we've worked together. Right. We started doing a little bit of business together when you were when you were at Bank of America mm -hmm. doing a lot of new construction. Yeah. And it's, it's cool to hear you talk about that transformation of like opening up more product for your clients. Right. Cause I've seen that firsthand. Yeah. And that's cool. now when we've got a borrower, when I've got a client who wants to buy a house and they need to borrow, it's almost like hey, Dylan's got something for you. Right. And that really happened when you got into that brokerage arena. Yeah. And it's opened up a lot of doors for me to, to be introduced to different types of business too. Like there's a lot of self-employed borrowers right. who might not show a lot of income on their tax returns. Yeah which is totally understandable, but the banks don't look at that as a positive. They mm -hmm. look at it as you're writing everything off. You yep. don't have any income. But in reality, if you look at bank statements and you understand the entirety of the business and the way the cash flow works, a lot of times there's plenty of income in there to qualify for a house. Right. So there's those other types of programs that we can fit somebody into, yeah. like a self-employed borrower, that like so many of us are yeah exactly employed borrowers right and we and we can help them get into that house yeah and we can help them make their dreams come true and a lot of self-employed borrowers like you just said mm -hmm. know each other yeah. so when you help one they're like hey can you help my buddy hey yeah. can you do this so it opens up a big door right for a lot of people to end up being able to buy or refinance their house mm -hmm. at the end of the day where otherwise they wouldn't have been able to yeah that's really good man yeah Let's talk a little bit about the market right now. Yeah. Like what we, this tidal wave that we've been <laughs> surfing on for the last shoot, a couple of years, which really like was ignited around that time when the whole, you know, pandemic hit. Yeah. I remember you and I had a, a, a couple of clients that we were working with at that time and it seemed like everything stopped. Right. And then after a few weeks, everything kicked into overdrive. Overdrive. Yeah. What did you see? on the loan side of things during that time? So I, I look back at that and there was a lot that happened in such a short period of time Yeah, for everybody, right? right? But in the loan side, what we saw was an uncertainty of the future of all finances, mm -hmm. of even our world, right? Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of banks that were out there that may have approved a buyer that had them fully approved, clear to close, already mm -hmm. signed loan documents, ready to right. fund. And the bank said, no, we are not funding this loan because we don't know what tomorrow looks like. So there were a lot of people that were in that position to buy and they got cut out. Yeah. And then there's also people who are in escrow where they're like, what's happening? What's happening? And you had to deal with that a lot. Yeah. Right. And so what we ended up seeing was the whole market stopping mm -hmm. and rates were still a little bit high and all the non-QM, non-qualified mortgage products mm -hmm. basically were put to a halt. Yeah. And then next thing you know, the Fed dropped the interest rate, rates got in the twos, mm -hmm. and that's when the flurry happened. People were saying, we need to buy while rates are low. Right. Because there's no better time. Right. So 
I mean, you saw what happened in the market. Yeah. Yeah. Things so. quickly kicked into overdrive. Like I would say mid April, 2020. Yeah. And it seemed like too, I, I remember the, the buyers that we were having get qualified with you. Like the rates were like rock bottom there Yeah, for a while. Yep. And I'm, we were wondering like how low can this yeah. thing get and how sustainable. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Do you remember when, um, when basically banks were like, we're not gonna, we're not gonna follow the bond market on this anymore. And yeah. like supply is too high. Right. We're going our own direction with rates. Yeah. And there was, there was that. And then there was also the rates got so low that there was such an influx of refinances that everybody, like all the banks were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like well, there's too much money going out. Right. And we don't know if it's coming back. Right. And that is at the same time that um, people are getting laid off. People are getting stimulus checks. Like yeah. the economy is just kind of like trying to figure out how to stay, stay put. Yep. Right. And stay afloat. Yeah. So things really changed a whole lot. Yeah. And then after a couple of months, we started really getting in a swing of things. Mm -hmm. People started figuring out, wow, we can work from home yeah. and keep our jobs. Yes. So it allowed people to keep their income to go buy. Yep. And it allowed people to figure out where they really truly wanted to live. Yeah. Right. And that was a huge thing. I mean, yep. we have people coming from all over the world. Right. To live here because it's one of the best places to live. Yeah. And I, I've talked to my clients about that, you know, how the, the housing market, like on my side, you know, of things has shifted so much, like the way people move around, yeah. you know, the country is completely different right. now. Yeah. And, and like you said, how they get to pick where they want to live. Right. And I know that <clears throat> on the real estate side of things, like there's been a lot of shifts and on the, the mortgage home loan side of things, there's been a lot of shifts too. Yeah. Like now we're entering, we, the market's been scalding hot. And we're entering into this time of a little bit of uncertainty with respect to like interest rates right. and what are they going to do? We've been hearing a lot about that. What have you been seeing? So since January 4th, um, rates have started to go up. The federal, the feds essentially said, Hey, we're going to start bumping up our federal funds rate Yep. and working on our balance sheet. And it put a lot of fear in the market to what's going to happen now mm -hmm. when money's more expensive to borrow. And we've seen gas prices go up, right? We've seen such low demand. Right. So rates have been on the rise and we've pushed up on the four percents. There's things in the fours. We're not in the fives yet, luckily, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you can still get rates in the threes. But yeah, I mean, it's it's added a whole percentage point to a qualified borrower. Right. Who was looking in December or January, maybe missed out on a couple of homes because the market's so hot. Right. And it's hard to get the offers accepted. Mm hmm. And now they're looking at a higher payment for the same price house. Yeah. But is that house the same price still? No, it's <laughs> still going up. Right. So like we're, we're trying to figure out like, what is that solution? And is there a, a giving point within like rates? Right. Are they going to hit a spot and come <clears throat> back down and kind of settle? Or will they just continue to rise until the federal government figures out what makes most sense and where their balance sheet needs to be? Yeah. So. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, we're watching it every day. Mm -hmm. I follow bond traders every day, so mm -hmm. I get updates on the daily. Yeah. Um, so it's it's cool to watch and cool to understand. Mm -hmm. um, so if you were a borrower and you were kind of like trying to predict and want to see what rates are doing, are you watching the federal funds rate? Are you, you watching the bond market? Or what, what do they correlate? Yeah, so I like to follow the 10-year treasury. Mm -hmm. um, it's a bond that, that trades very frequently and, and closely with mortgage rates. Okay. Uh, mortgages essentially are bonds at the end of the day, mm -hmm. so they, they trade very close. And then a little like street tip, I guess you would say, is check out gas prices. Okay. I mean, when gas prices start to rise and you're driving to work in the morning and you're like, oh my gosh, gas went up 10 cents today, Yeah. expect the rates are going to go up a little bit too. So they correlate with each they other. They correlate, not on a daily, not a day-to-day -day basis, right. but pretty pretty close. Yeah, generally yeah. speaking. Exactly. Nice. So I know we've had to have that conversation with some of our clients who are like, I'm approved up to this price point um, based on this rate. And we've been having to like, Hey, we need to get something now, right? Because one tick up, you know, a quarter of a point of an interest rate, a half a point, and they're out of that market. Right. And that might be like a buyer who's right on the fringe of affording a single family in San Clemente, let's say. And if that last one is gobbled up, yeah, there might not be another one at that price, right? And if the rates go up, it might mean the difference of shifting between a single family and a condo. And a condo. Yep. Exactly. So. I would suggest always 
add like a, a percentage point at this point, a half to 1% to your qualification yeah. and to your payment so that you know that when you're going to look at that house, if that rate's that high, expect to pay that. And you can always come back from there. Right. But That's if good. you're still thinking about a 3.25, yeah. you're, you're not a real buyer in this market thinking about the proper things, right? Mm -hmm. You're, you have to look at it as tomorrow. What's, what's it going to look like? Right. You can't just keep going up and up and up. You have to start at a higher point and draw back a right. little bit. And I, I think there's a lot of good wisdom in that. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, the rates we're looking at, these are phenomenal interest rates, exactly. a 4% interest rate. <laughs> yes. I mean, you and I weren't here to see when rates were 13, 15% for, you know, the generation before us, right. but we've heard about it. Yeah, exactly. We've heard plenty about it. Yeah. And just to make a, a point out of this too, there was a point in my career as a loan officer where we were at the 5% mark in rates. Mm -hmm. And I think that was in 2017 and 2018. Right. I, I mean, that. I had a couple buyers who were high fours, low fives, mm -hmm. and we're not even really there yet. Right. You know, Jeez. so yeah. So, I mean, we'll, we'll see, um, you know, home prices being higher. A lot of people are, you know, looking at condos too and trying to figure out where it works best for them. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we'll see how it plays out. Yep. Yep. Let's talk a little bit. Like I know there's listeners out there, people who have approached me, like kind of talking more tactically about a loan. Mm -hmm. Um, what Ryan, what's the minimum that I can put down or what's the most that I have to put down to get alone. And a lot of times I'm like, well, there's so many, it's a good question. Yeah. yeah it's a good question, but it's, it's not just one down payment percentage right. that's required. So exactly. speak into that. And there's not bit. just one product out there. So, I mean, to be candid, you can buy a house with zero down. There's grant programs that are provided by the state of California to help you with your down payment. Wow. They'll give you a down payment. Yeah. You still have to cover some closing costs. There's still expenses to buying the house. But if you think about, oh, if I have to save 20%, how long is that going to take me? Right. How many years will that take based off my income? And when will I get there? Right. But you might be able to get in the door today with nothing down with the money you have in your bank account. And now you're a homeowner. Yeah. And now you have equity and you can leverage that for the rest of your life. Yeah. So, and your payment never changes, which is always nice. That's so good. Yeah. So the answer to that question is like, there, there isn't a minimum. There's there no minimum. so many different products. Right. Am I, am I right? You're, in that? you're right. Yeah, exactly. So there's, I mean, we have, there's products out there for jumbo loans, mm -hmm. which are like known as the most stringent loan out there Yeah. with 10% down. Some really? cases, 5%. Okay. You know, so there's, there's product out there for a lot of different scenarios and for a lot of different types of home buyers. Yeah. It's just figuring out based on when we look at the application, look at the whole scenario mm -hmm. as a whole, it's, you know, it needs to fit within one of those, right. One of those ranges. So what is the, the jumbo loan limit for those of us that so, don't know? Yeah. So we're at 947 now. So any, any home, any loan amount over 947,000 mm -hmm. is considered a jumbo loan. Okay. Yeah. So, and that's um, not a, you mentioned earlier, non QM. Yeah. So that's a different pro product. Okay. So, so we can go over a couple of different products too. So yeah. we do the, the standard, like we love doing VA loans and helping our veterans. Yep. FHA loans are great for people who have low down payments mm -hmm. and need to get qualified. Um, we have the conventional loan products that are standard Fannie, Freddie. Yep. We have jumbo loans. Mm -hmm. We have non QM loans, which are essentially they're called non-qualified mortgages. Got it. They qualify these mortgages, but they're based off different qualifications. Okay. Bank statement loans, mm -hmm. 1099 income. So less traditional. Exactly. And less conventional. Less I conventional. Guess. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So um, there's pros and cons to all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's other products that are really cool for like investors. There's a debt service coverage ratio loan uh -huh. to where they don't even have to qualify for that property with their own income. If that property rents for the mortgage payment, you're qualified, wow. but there's a certain down payment requirement. There you go. So right? there's always a trade off. There's always something. Yeah. There's always something there. Yep. Yeah. So there's a lot of different product out there and all different down payment options. Yeah. So really at the end of the day, I mean, if you're wondering, yeah. give us a call, you know, and we'll figure out Good. what works best for you. Yeah. I think that's important for somebody listening who, who really has, you know, I want to get a house. I want to get into this market. Yeah. I'm not sure if I've got the down payment or I'm not sure what type of loan I get, but I've got income. I know I make money. Right. 
that's a conversation they need to have with you. Exactly. Because you probably have a product for them. Yeah. And if I don't have a product today, it doesn't mean there's going to be not going to be something or they're not going to be in a position to get that product in six months. Yeah. And a lot of home buying is preparation. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are afraid to take that step or to make that call yeah. because they're sharing something so valuable and important to themselves right. and they might be nervous or scared or, you know, it's just, we don't, we don't judge based off an application. We do everything we can to help reach your goals. Yeah. And that's the main goal. Yeah. That's a very good point. Yeah. And that's why I always tell clients who are thinking or, you know, like I want to get into a property or, or we're, we might even be shopping. Yeah. And they don't have necessarily like the, the loan and the payment and all that ironed out yet. Right. And I'm like, Hey, you've got to talk with a, with a right. mortgage guy and get, get everything ironed out right. so that you can be in a position to be successful because the market's moving like this. Yes. The cadence is fast it's going. And if you don't have your finances, your mortgage squared away, it's going to be difficult to know what you can push an offer to. Right. And that comes to, to, to the actual transit action itself when you get your offer accepted. Yeah. You have a time frame, right, as a buyer and you have contingencies you have to remove at certain times. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times like you'll push up on that closing date because you didn't prepare ahead of time. Mm -hmm. If you don't go through the the pre-approval process up front and supply all the documentation to buy the house it's going to be a whirlwind of a transaction. Right. Right. And that's not fun for anybody. Yeah. So if you are prepared as a buyer mm -hmm. and you know what your payment looks like, you have the documentation and you understand the underwriting process, you know, the team, you know who to talk to, you know, yeah. to work with, it's going to be smooth sailing. Yeah. But if you, if you're not prepared, you better hold on tight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We've seen that firsthand. Right. I mean, on our side of things, you know, a residential purchase agreement, one that's competitive in this market is like a 30 day escrow. Right. And a buyer has, you know, seven, 10 days to do their home inspection, make sure they want the house. Right. And anywhere from 10 to 17 days to know that they've got their loan. Right. And that is, this market has trimmed out all the fat and fluff of extra time. Yeah. It's like a seller wants to know, do you want my house? <laughs> right. Tell me quickly. Yeah. Yes. Can you get your loan? Right. Tell me quickly. Otherwise it's, you've got to sign your rights away to that deposit that's in escrow. Right. So how, when somebody's working with you, like you were just saying, like you, that's why you have to be teed up. You've right. got to have right. your ducks in a row before you get into escrow yeah. on something. Yep. And talk into that a little bit, like how your process yeah. works to be, to, to fulfill those requirements? Yeah. So, I mean, that's a really good question because it's a, it's pretty broad and it, it changes based on who you go to, right? Yeah. Loan officer wise. But what I always do, and this goes back to my experience in Irvine with the new builds, right. I did hundreds of pre-approvals, okay. right? Not pre-qualifications. There's a difference there. There's a pre-approval, a pre-qualification. I'll tell you if a pre-qualification is us sitting down, Hey Ryan, let's complete this application. I'm going to pull your credit. And I'm going to approve you based on what you put on your application. No okay. supporting documentation, right? So I could just, whatever I tell you goes. You can tell me you make X amount a month and that's what I use for your pre-qualification. Okay. And so as an agent, when you're going out to put offers on a property and you have a pre-qualification, yeah. you're not that confident with those time frames, with telling your client, hey, let's remove the contingencies. Let's do this, that, the other. Right. Whereas when you have a pre-approval, I go through the application, we pull credit, I review all the documentation, income, assets, get letters of explanation, make sure everything's buttoned up. Got it. Right. Make sure everything is pre underwritten so that when it gets to that underwriter, they're like, wow, this is buttoned up and we know exactly what we're looking at. Yeah. So there's a huge sense. difference in yeah. a pre-qual versus a pre-approval. Yes, exactly. So that's why we pre-approve every buyer. Got it. We, we always do a pre-approval. So when that buyer goes shopping with one of your pre-approvals, they're ready to go. Yes. And I will call, I will answer the call and I will say X, Y, and Z. This buyer is fully approved because I know at the bottom of my heart they are. Yeah. And I've already run through the scenario. My team's run through the scenario with multiple sets of eyes on it. Yep. So we know moving forward, we can get this done. That's good. Cause yeah. as a listing agent, if I'm getting an offer from, you know, an agent and a lender, right. They've got the offer, they've got the pre-approval letter. I don't necessarily know 
maybe that that agent or that lender, right. I'm calling them yeah, because I want to talk to the lender. Right. I want to make sure this buyer, if they get into escrow with my seller, is yeah. going to be able to get the financing right. they say they can get. Right. And that's where the rubber meets the road. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, we always go through that in depth up front. And a lot of times uh, a client or a borrower will be like, Dylan, why are you doing this to me? And then they realize later on, they're like, wow, that was a huge difference. I would rather you ask me that for those items two days before I got my offer accepted yeah. than a day after. Right. When I'm also signing escrow documents, signing contracts, focusing on my inspections and buying my house. Yeah. They don't want to be sending me a bunch of documentation, Gosh, that's, you know? Yep, yep. So I try to plan it out like that so that they can get a hundred percent of everything in before the offer even gets accepted. Mm -hmm. And so that's smooth sailing through the process. Nice. Yeah. So one of the things that I wanted, I was excited to talk to you about today is like talking about escrows and buying a house. Yeah. Like this is, this is present day, super relevant. Most of the offers that I'm getting or I'm writing, we're taking out the appraisal contingency yeah. because, um, on the realtor side of things, you know, we don't want to put the purchase in the hands of an appraiser. We don't right. know necessarily who we're going to get. Right. Um, we don't know what they, their opinion of the property's value is not necessarily all the buyers, the market's be. opinion. Right. Exactly. So, um, what, what do you like, how does that play into your process and what do you think about that? So essentially we're, we're talking appraisal contingency removals yes. here, right? Yes. So, so we're putting an offer on a house and we're saying no matter what the value comes back at that the appraiser says, we're still going to buy the house for our offer price. Yeah. And so a client will be like, well, what, what does that mean to me? Right. And so if the appraisal comes in low, like let's just say something happens, the appraisal comes in low. Yeah. We always do a rebuttal one to start. Mm -hmm. So we go back to the appraiser with additional comps and additional information to send to them so that they could bring up the value of the property. Got it. That is in the hands of the appraiser again. So mm -hmm. as a buyer, you want to take matters into your own hands at times so that you know what to expect if that does come in low. Right. Do we make up the difference in cash? Yeah. Can we borrow any of that difference? What does that look like? Yeah. And the answer is yes to both. Okay. Right. So when you're buying that house and you're running through the numbers and you go, Hey, maybe this thing will come in 15, $25,000 short. Yeah. At that point, you should have that money ready to go on the side, whether it's in a 401k or a different account, have it ready because okay. you may need to use it. Yeah. If you don't have that money ready or you don't want to use it, you can borrow a little bit more. So you're putting down the same amount. Mm -hmm. You borrow a little bit more. You may have to pay a little bit of mortgage insurance, but you get to keep the money in your pocket Got and it. you get the house. So this is a super important conversation to be having with your realtor, yes. with your lender. Yes. Because like I said, most sellers are expecting this, the purchase not to hinge on an appraisal. Right. The appraisal still gets done. Right. But the value, they don't, they don't care. Right. And if you're getting a 20% down loan and you only have 20%. Right. And there's a difference. Yep. You don't have the money to make it up. Right. So you cannot remove that contingency on that offer. Right. And the, and the reason that is, is because the bank will only lend on what the appraiser says the property's worth, not right. how many offers were on the property, how many offers were in at that asking price, yeah. how many people went to look through that property and appraisers use comparables, right? Previous homes that sold within the last six months, mm -hmm. but it doesn't take into account the property down the street that went into escrow and is about to close tomorrow. Right. Right. That might be a new record sale or what, you know, what it might be. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's just the banks will only lend up to that amount. So you'd have to make up that difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, um, there's a million different scenarios there like is. out there, right. But the takeaway from wh what I'm hearing from you is have that conversation up front. Yep. Have a strategy in place because you might, you can make up the difference in cash. You might be able to borrow a little bit more, right. go for a higher loan to value. Correct. Um, but have that strategy talk, right? Right. And it's, yeah, I mean, it goes back to just understanding what you're doing throughout that process. Yeah. And it's, it's a lot of preparation. And what's funny is we never really had to do, we always prepared a client, but we've never had to prepare them to this extent. I know. And like, we're really preparing clients for anything that can happen. Yeah. And making sure that they're ready to go. Yep. So that's, yeah. uh, that's what I meant by like, we, we've 
we've all trimmed up. Like we're yeah. in fighting shape yeah. in <laughs> yep. this market. Yeah, we are. Because you've got to be, you've got to be ready to pull all the punches, yeah. pull out all the stops, be ready to bob and weave. Right. And it's something that I've seen. Um, I know that like the Bay Area market has been doing this for a long time. Yeah. Uh, markets like, you know, certain markets in Seattle, just like ultra competitive markets that were this way in 2016 right. and 17. Right. And getting back to how the pandemic and how that changed where people can go and where they can move. Now we've got those buyers down here and they're like, watch this. Yeah, exactly. We've, we're used to this. Right. So our market's adapting and evolving and changing. Right. And and tomorrow's market may be different. Right. Right. So staying on our toes, making sure that we're there and present for our clients and understanding what's going on is huge. Yeah. So, yeah. That's so good. Yeah. All right. So talk to me too about like when a borrower getting back, because I, I want to touch on that pre-approval again. Yeah. Like when they reach out to you, what's the first step they take to get a pre-approval going? So the first step is completing the application with me. Okay. I'll walk through the application over the phone. Um, we also have options where you can fill it out online if you're in a time crunch mm -hmm. or you need to do it late at night. But the first step is that application. Mm -hmm. We'll review the application together. We'll do a credit check and we'll game plan for what the next steps are. Nice. How much time should one set aside? Like if I was going to get so, a pre-approval. So an application, hours? no. So an application, if you fill it out yourself online, 10 yeah. to 15 minutes, Nice. it's a click through application. Fairly simple to do. Yeah. You do need information though. You have to provide employment information, asset information, you know, personal information. So take the time to do that properly and correctly up front, mm -hmm. make things smooth throughout the process later on. Um, credit report comes in, then we review everything with the client, send them a documents needed list after our review mm -hmm. to understand what's happening. And that whole process takes about 24 hours okay. to get pre-approved if we get everything from the client that day. Nice. So we can turn, turn and burn pretty quick. Yeah. So, and that's a full approval. I mean, that's all documentation, mm -hmm. knowing 100%. If we buy a house today, we're closing. Nice. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty quick. Um, yeah, go ahead. I, kn I know that have like you touch on this, having the documentation yeah. is key, right? It is. Cause some of us, I know I'm not as organized. Yeah. Thankfully I have my wife <laughs> yeah. who's a lot more organized. Most of us are like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you've got to have those things ready. So yes. what, like, Tax so, yeah. So, so pay stubs. So just, let's just say somebody is a W2 borrower. Yeah. Just basic income. Right. So we would need pay stubs. Mm -hmm. la two most recent, mm -hmm. your last two years of W2s. Yep. 2020, 2021, um, last two years of tax returns and proof of funds. Mm -hmm. That's what we'll need. Nice. Um, the application, the credit report, and then we ask questions based off that. So it's, it's simple stuff when you break it down like that. But it's funny because if you ask me like five years ago where my tax returns were, I'm like, I, I don't know. Yeah. I need to call TurboTax, you <laughs> yeah. know, and they don't even have a phone number. You yeah. Know? And you get, we get that question a lot, yeah. right? Yeah. It's so like, oh, shoot, where do I, where do you want me to grab my pay stubs from? Right. Exactly. So luckily because, and I've, this is another thing I've noticed in the pandemic is because everybody's at home and they've had to restructure their work life at home. Yeah. They're more organized with those things as well. Mm -hmm. So I've had a lot of people be able to send me those very quick almost while we're on the phone. Nice. Yeah. So that's cool that you've picked up on that. Yeah. We're I mean, all a little bit more organized. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For the <laughs> most part. Right. So yeah. So those documents are, are pretty big. Um, or those are the, those are the main ones. And, um, and we'll ask for little things here and there, like some supporting documentation, um, you know, offer letters if you're getting a new job, mm -hmm. things like that. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. What have you seen? Like, I know for a while there last year you were doing, um, a big amount of refinances because yeah. rates were low, right? Right. How I'm curious, like what have you seen in the refinance market lately? Yeah. Oh, rates have gone up and it's, I mean, it's not non-existent, but the, the, the rate and term refinance that we had in the twos is, is gone. Yeah. So refinances have dried up. There's a lot of people out there who stu still do need or could benefit from a, from a debt consolidation loan. Right. So they may have a uh, rate in the twos, but maybe they pulled out a second to do construction on their house yeah. and they're paying five or 6% on the second. Mm. Right. So we might be able to consolidate those two debts, maybe a car, maybe a couple things here or there yeah. with high interest uh -huh. and your payment actually comes out less. And then we work with financial advisors too, who we can link up that information to if the client approves of it. Yeah. 
and they can send us like how much money you'd have in 30 years if you were just to invest that money you're saving on a monthly basis. Wow. And you could plan for retirement. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot of cool things in the refinance world, but rates have gone up. Mm -hmm. So traditional rate and terms, they're just, they're not really there anymore. Yeah. That's one that's interesting. We had uh, Eric Bischoff financial advisor on and, yeah. and he kind of talked about that. Like, you know, is it, does it behoove you possibly to pull some cash out of a property that you have a ton of equity on right. and put that into a different type of investment? Right. Cause again, getting back to how low interest rates are historically, right. A different market might be able to outpace or, or should outpace Correct. that interest rate. Exactly. And somebody can make some money doing that. And it could lead to financial freedom. I mean, right. you could end up having your house paid off a lot of money in the bank and retiring early if mm -hmm. you plan for it. But again, going back to it, not a lot of people take that first step yeah. to make that call, to, to do that plan. Mm -hmm. And it's huge. I mean, it can change your life. Right. You know, so yeah, it's, it's good stuff. Yeah. I tell, I tell a lot of my clients like, Hey, you've got to be working with your loan officer, your, your mortgage guy, yeah. like just as much as you're working with me and right. you want to have somebody too that right. you can text call, right? Not kind of in that traditional yeah. yes. bankers exactly. hours, right? I know. Yep. Yeah. So, so do you, is that, how do you like to work with your clients? Yeah. I'm, I mean, it's funny because you look back at where we're, where we live and how we're raised. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're not, here in San Clemente, we're not like buttoned up suit and tie type of people. There's people out there that do it, yeah. but we're pretty like laid back and relaxed, mm -hmm. um, which is really nice. Um, but the approach when working with like you, for instance, it's very easy to understand at what point in the process these clients are yeah. not just checkbox wise, mm -hmm. but thought process wise. Yeah. How are they feeling? Where are they looking? what, like what's going on here? What's going on there? How are their finances looking? I, you know, I call and say, Hey, this is something that we need to look out for. Hey, this is we're we're golden. We're good on this. Mm -hmm. Hey, it's approved. The communication is key. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of agents aren't necessarily looking to sit on the phone all day with their mortgage guy, mm -hmm. right? Pipeline meetings, all that stuff. So it's really nice to be able to, to be flexible, have different ways to communicate with the agents. That's yeah. not bugging them, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but still keeping them updated. Yeah. So, and then with a borrower, when they're working through you mm -hmm. with you and through yeah. you on the process of buying a property, yeah. it, you're chatting with them. You're not disappearing. Like I've, I've had a lot of people who, and I want to, I want to touch on this because it really matters who like, it really matters who you use for your loan. Yeah. It's not just an interest rate, right? you have to be able to communicate with this person, right? You can't do it all online. Right. Exactly. And so when you're working with your, like, are you guys talking every day or? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's, it changes. I've talked to clients multiple times a day. I talk to them once a week, yeah. you know, it really depends where you're at in the process. Right. But I do always have the phone on me. Mm -hmm. It's always near, always in communication. Yeah. And I think there's certain milestones throughout the process where you have to like pat yourself on the back as a lender and a realtor and as a client yeah. or as somebody buying a house where you're like, wow, we got submitted to underwriting. Hey, cool. Pat on the back. Like yeah. that's the next step. Right. And there's a milestone where I'll call you and say, Hey, we just got submitted to underwriting. Like expect a, a call back in a couple of days with your loan approval. Right. And they're excited, yeah. you know, and it's like, okay, that's another check. So the, the further on you go with those check marks, the better you feel about the transaction. Yeah. And then also those communication points really help too. Mm -hmm. And with the team behind me too. Yep. I mean, I have a lot of clients that don't even really call me. They'll call my assistant and they're like, Hey, can I do this? Or, Hey, what about this? Or can I send you this? So it's nice to have that backup team too. Yeah. You've got coverage. Exactly. Nice. So when I'm on a call or when I'm doing my things, they're there. Yep. Yeah. You had mentioned underwriters, like touch a uh, underwriters. I feel like is kind of people. We know what we know what it means, but we really don't know what they're doing back there. <laughs> I know, like everybody thinks they're just behind a screen and like judging you. you yeah, know? yeah, that's yeah. like what people are like. What what's going on? You know. Yep. But at the end of the day, the underwriter's responsibility is to make sure that loan can get sold and fulfilled to the secondary market, which is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Mm -hmm. So the government's backing these loans, and they need to be sold to the government. Yep. And so the underwriter will essentially look at the property, mm -hmm. the credit 
the income and the assets. Got Those it. are the four main things. They're making sure the property's in good condition. One, why they hire an appraiser, right? right That's right. the appraiser's job. Yep. Make sure it's not uh, falling down. Make sure there's no litigation. Make sure those those things, like the property checks the boxes. Yeah. Credit, good credit, follows guidelines. You know, expenses make sense. And then also income. Income is a big thing, right? We were talking about self-employed borrowers. Right. So they'll review self-employed income to make sure that it's that it's meeting the the product guidelines for that specific product. Mm -hmm. And and then they review assets too. Make sure there's no extra large deposits. Make sure you didn't get money from another country. Things like that. You know. Yeah, that's always a fun one. It's the bank statements. Everybody, you know, that's one thing I could say that made a big difference was understanding how to use bank statements and teaching clients how to obtain bank statements online. Yes. Because there's all these nuances that the underwriters want that you or I on a normal day would be. Like, what are you asking me? This yeah. is kind of crazy. Yeah. You know, like that's asking a lot. But when you know how to explain it and go through that process, it makes it a lot easier. You're like, oh, I get that. Yep. And so we prepare all of those things that I've noticed. The property, you're out with the, looking at the property, doing your inspections. I've already reviewed credit and income and assets. I know they're ready for the underwriter. Mm -hmm. So now it's my processor's job to package it nicely and make it look good. So the underwriter looks at it and they go, wow, this is a super clean loan. Yeah. They prepared this nicely for me. Let me just start going through and checking the boxes and nice. it doesn't bring up other questions. Mm -hmm. so, so that's, that's what it really means to be squared away. So the underwriting process starts at the application uh -huh. at the end of the day. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the whole process until your loan gets clear to close, which means you got final approval. Yeah. That's a that's, good day. That, that's when the underwriter's done. <laughs> that's when like everything's pretty much done. You sign your loan docs and we fund the loan. Yep. But we prepare for underwriting day one. Got it. Yeah. That's, that adds a lot of clarity. Yeah. I mean, even, okay. So being in the business as a realtor, like even when we've got loans for our personal yeah. property, it's grueling it at is. certain points. It's grueling because you, you really feel like you're, you're being undressed a little bit <laughs> Yeah. and like I'm in the business. Right. Yeah. And I can see it like when my wife gets frustrated or something because they're chipping away. Yeah. They got to know. Yep. But at the end of the day, it's like you said, the underwriters got to do their job right? and make sure this thing checks out. Yeah. Make sure, what are you transferring money around for just to make sure it's all good because right. it, that loan has to ultimately, will likely get sold. Right. Right. On exactly. A, on a secondary market. Yep. Um, how does that work? Because I know a lot of people are like, what does that mean? My loan gets sold. Yeah. So um, there's so many loans that get funded and there's so many loans that fall within a certain category yeah. that instead of taking loans one by one and saying, Hey, Fanny, Hey, Freddie, here's one loan for you. They package up, let's call it, they usually use dollar amounts. So a hundred million dollars worth of loan notes. Yep. They'll put it in a package and they'll sell it to either a investor, like mm -hmm. a big hedge fund, or they'll sell it to Fanny, Freddie. Yep or they'll sell it to another source. Got it. And so they'll pay money to buy those good loans. Mm -hmm. And if you look back into like the 2008 market, right. that was the big problem. That secondary market was so manipulated mm. by all these different types of loan packages that they didn't really know what they were buying, but they didn't care because they were making a bunch of money. Yeah. So now think about present day, they're, they're dialed in. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're making sure nothing slips through the cracks, right. you know? So that's the underwriter's job. Make sure that that loan's buttoned up so yeah. it can be sold in the secondary market mm -hmm. because the bank, the underwriter works at needs to get that money off their books so they can go fund more loans. Yeah. And I think I get this question a lot. People ask me like, what's the market going to do? And, you know, because we're in these very unique times right. with, you know, the market appreciating so quickly and naturally people want to ask like, is something like what happened in 2007 and eight going to happen again? Right. But it's important to understand that people that are getting loans right now, you, you cannot fake this. No, it is so, you know, challenging yes. to get a loan yeah. and, and to check all the boxes. Yep. And I think in the last market, you know, I wasn't selling houses then, but I've learned from it. I've yeah. studied it. Right. You could write down, yeah, I make whatever I want to make. Right. And the, the checks and balances weren't in place. They weren't in place. Yeah. And that's what ultimately led to that financial yeah. crisis. And it, and it happened so quick because we had a lot of, 
not we, but the market had a lot of three year, five year and seven year adjustable rate loans right. that were essentially interest only for that first time period. Yeah. So the payments were nothing. Right. And then next thing you know, for the next 25 years, you're paying principal and interest on a higher rate that's adjusting on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. And it put a lot of people, it got a lot of people into properties, second, third, fourth, fifth homes. Jeez. And then they go, well, we didn't put a whole lot down on those and our payment just went up. Let's just walk away. And then they got a slap on the wrist, yeah. right? So that's what ultimately led a lot of the resort places, Florida, yeah, California yeah. had some of it. There's a lot of places like that where money was just flowing, yep. right? People were buying houses. Anybody was buying a house, right? They didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. So it was just promoting home ownership at a terrible cost, Yeah. you know, like terrible cost. Yeah. It really came down from the top. Like you said, right. yeah, the government was promoming home ownership yeah. and there just wasn't enough checks and balances right. in place to, to verify that people could afford these homes. Exactly. And when the market took a shift, that's when it all went away because yep. the equity was gone. Yeah. And the good thing, the, the pro of that is a lot of licensing got put into place. Yes. The licensing to become a loan officer is not easy. You need to, and you have background checks, you have criminal checks. Wow. I mean, credit reports yeah. just to become a loan officer and you have to maintain that every year. Mm -hmm. So we do continuing education every year just to maintain our license, which is obviously a good thing. Yeah. I like doing it cause I learn a lot too, yep. but it's also good for a consumer because mm -hmm. they know that when you pass those tests, you're not fraudulent right. for the most part, right. right? There's some people out there maybe, but yeah, when you pass all of that, I mean, you're, you're in it to help them, to get them into that next step yeah. and you're prepared and you know, so it's good, man. Yeah. So it's nice to have all that licensing in place too. Awesome. Well, this has been super helpful. Yeah. I think it, we've covered a ton of like yeah. questions that you and I get on a daily basis. Yeah. So thanks for joining us, man. Thanks for being yeah, here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I yeah. like being here. It's good talking. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Right on. Thank you. Yep.